by votes on the floor, so apologies for that. Uh, I, I want to note we're holding this hearing both in person and remotely and in compliance with the regulations for committee uh, proceedings pursuant to House Resolution uh, 8. Uh, generally, we ask witnesses who are joining us remotely to keep their microphones muted when not speaking to limit background noise, and witnesses will need to unmute themselves when recognized for their five minutes or when answering a question. If you're joining remotely, please keep your camera on at all times, even if you need to step away for a moment. Please do not leave the meeting or turn your camera off. At this time, I ask unanimous consent that the chair be authorized to declare a recess of the committee at any point and that all members have five legislative days in which to revise and extend their remarks and have any written statements be made part of the record and without objection, that is so ordered. The independent state legislature theory holds that each state's legislature has the exclusive authority to regulate federal elections under the United States Constitution. The theory is not grounded in history, precedent, or logic, but it has gained an increasing following in some uh, sectors of America over the past 20 years, and its adherents may include some current Supreme Court justices. In this upcoming term, the Supreme Court will hear the case of Moore v. Harper, in which the North Carolina Supreme Court struck down the state legislature's uh, gerrymandering of the state's congressional districts. The state Supreme Court, uh, of which my colleague from North Carolina was once an esteemed member, relied on various provisions of the state's constitution as the basis for its decision. The United States Supreme Court will decide whether those provisions of the North Carolina Constitution apply to all uh, to federal elections at all. We're here today to examine this legal theory to discuss the historical evidence or lack thereof supporting it and perhaps more importantly to explore the dramatic and disruptive consequences to American democracy that would ensue if the court endorses it. This topic may seem dry at times but consider this. All 50 states have election administrators. Some are elected, some are appointed, some are single individuals, some are boards, but none are the state's actual legislature. This makes sense. Professional, nonpartisan election administration is a cornerstone of the modern American right to vote. Depending on how the court resolves this upcoming case, that entire apparatus could vanish overnight, at least for federal elections, which I would say is fairly important and state politicians would suddenly find themselves in charge of federal elections. That ex is exactly what the framers sought to avoid. The Constitution is in many ways a reflection of what came before it, and the failed experiment of the Articles of Confederation, which illustrated the perils of leaving the federal government at the mercy of individual states. As the Supreme Court has explained and our witnesses today can confirm, the animating purpose of the Constitution's elections clause was to avoid repeating that mistake. The independent state legislature theory would turn that goal on its head and give state legislatures power over federal elections. There are admittedly nuances to the theory. One version which focuses on non-delegation theory would essentially dissolve all 50 state election administration offices. Another version, which focuses on state constitu constitutional provisions that lack specific standards, would have a narrower, although still disruptive, impact. We look forward to our witnesses guiding us through those nuances today. But make no mistake, for many supporters, the independent state legislature theory is part of a broader plan to seize uh, control of elections. In that sense, the theory is linked to the big lie. Uh, to former President Trump's scheme to violate the Electoral Count Act and to send the election back to the state legislatures and to the election subversion bills we see around the country that shifts power away from professional election administrators towards politicians. That makes the theory dangerous and disruptive to American democracy, and we hope to explore that point in today's hearing. And I now would recognize uh, the ranking member, Mr. Davis, for his opening statement. Thank you, Madam Chair. Today's hearing topic is one that many Americans are unfamiliar with, mostly because it's a complicated legal theory that's, that's really hard to define. You see, if you ask Democrats what independent state legislature theory means, you'll get one answer. If you ask Republicans, you'll, you'll get something different. This theory focuses on the Constitution's use of the word legislature and what that means, specifically how much authority is given to a state's legislature to determine election law. So as a committee, 
we should be using this as an opportunity to gather the facts, not make any accusations or insinuations. I say that because I know that some on the left, including sanctioned Democrat lawyer Mark Elias, are already setting the stage ahead of, the tw of 2024, suggesting this theory is all a grand plan by Republicans to steal the election, which is not only ludicrous, but completely untrue and unfounded. In fact, we're even seeing some on the left use this theory as a, quote, doomsday type scenario to fundraise on. <laughs> a typical. And an excuse to cover their favorite topic, President Trump and the 2020 presidential election. All in an effort to support the January 6th committee's investigation. But no matter how the left tries to spin it, Republicans believe that the Constitution is clear. Article 1, Section 4 states the times, places, and manner of holding elections for senators and representatives shall be prescribed in each state by the legislature thereof. But the Congress may at any time by law make or alter such regulations. Further, the Presidential Electors Clause states each state appoint in such manner as the legislature thereof may direct a number of electors. So, this shouldn't be controversial. Republicans and Democrats should both agree that states have the primary authority to establish election law and administer, administer federal elections, and that Congress plays a secondary role. This is why yesterday I introduced the American Confidence in Elections Act. It's the ACE Act, a comprehensive bill focusing on the importance of strong election integrity reforms that meet the moment by bolstering voter confidence in our elections while respecting the Constitution, federalism, and conservative principles. The ACE Act ensures states maintain primary authority over elections while providing them with the tools they can quickly implement to restore voter confidence and election integrity. And it also removes outdated federal policies standing in their way. The Constitution divides authority between Congress and the states. That's why the bill is coupled with model state legislature legislation for state legislatures to consider as we work to improve election integrity. The same election legislation we Republicans will implement in the District of Columbia to ensure that after years of election crises in the district, residents can trust that their votes will be counted fairly and accurately. Our driving principle is that every eligible, every eligible American should have the opportunity to vote and that their ballot should be counted according to law. Unlike the partisan HR1 that was crafted behind closed doors, my bill has been drafted publicly over the course of two years and is the product of feedback and ideas from a large and diverse set of members of Congress, stakeholders, secretaries of state, state legislators, and local election administrators across 18 states and territories. Both Republicans, like me, and Democrats, like my colleagues. In fact, we've been working on this bill since before the last presidential election. I invite any of my colleagues across the aisle to join me in supporting this bill that empowers states to run free, fair, and secure elections. Elections that promote voters' confidence and drive strong turnout. House administration Republicans will continue to champion policies that respect the primary role of states over elections and ensure that it gets Congress out of the way. And thank you again, Madam Chair, I yield back. The gentleman yields back. Um, I will now turn to our witnesses um, and uh, who I'll introduce in just a minute. Uh, I would just note for, those, for the, our witness who is uh, appearing virtually, there is a, a timer on your screen. We ask, ask each of our witnesses to uh, confine their oral testimony to about five minutes and your for, full written statement will be made part of the record. So welcome to each of our witnesses and thank you for taking the time to be with us today. Joining us are Professor Richard H. Pildes from the NYU School of Law, Professor Carolyn Shapiro from the Chicago Kent School of Law, and Eliza Swearen Becker, counsel with the Brennan Center for Justice. Uh, professor Pildes is the Sudler Family a professor of constitutional law at the NYU School of Law and is one of the nation's leading scholars of constitutional law and a specialist in legal issues concerning democracy, a former law clerk 
to Justice Thurgood Marshall. He's been elected into the American Academy of Arts and Sciences and the American Law Institute, and has also received recognition as a Guggenheim Fellow and a Carnegie Scholar. In dozens of articles in his acclaimed case book, The Law of Democracy, he's helped create an entirely new field of study in law schools. His work in this field systematically explores legal and policy issues concerning the structure of democratic elections and institutions, such as the role of money in politics, the design of election districts, the regulation of political parties, the structure of voting systems, and the representation of minority interests in democratic institutions and similar issues. Carolyn Shapiro is a press professor of law at the Chicago Kent College of Law. She is the founder and co-director of Chicago Kent's Institute on the Supreme Court of the United States. From 2014 through 2016, she served as Illinois Solicitor General while on leave from the law school and is a former law clerk to Justice Stephen Breyer. Her scholarship is largely focused on the Supreme Court, its relationship to other courts and institutions, and its role in our constitutional democracy. She teaches classes in legislation and statutory interpretation, constitutional law, employment law, and public interest law and policy. And finally, Eliza Swearin Becker is a counsel with the Brennan Center for Justice, where she focuses on voting rights and elections. Ms. Swearin Becker recently co-authored an article examining the history and original intent of the Constitution's Elections Clause. Prior to joining the Brennan Center, she was a litigation associate in private practice at Boies Schiller uh, Flexner LLP and served as a law clerk to the Honorable Christina A. Snyder of the United States District Court for the Central District of California. She received her JD from Harvard Law and a master's degree in public policy from the Harvard Kennedy School. Professor Pildes, you are now recognized uh, for five minutes for your testimony. Thank you, Chair Loughran, and Ranking Member Davis, and the committee for giving me this opportunity to testify. I'll address two issues in my opening remarks. First, what are the potential practical implications should the Supreme Court recognize the independent state legislature theory? And second, what is the historical evidence, either for or against, the recognition of that theory? In discussing these, que in discussing these questions, it's crucial to recognize that the issue is not simply the yes or no one of whether the Constitution does or does not create an independent state legislature. There are several different versions of such a potential doctrine, as the chair and the ranking member acknowledge, and they have quite different practical implications. Thus, if the court were to recognize the doctrine, the question of its scope would be just as important as to as whether there is such a doctrine at all. Uh, on the first issue, the most extreme version of such a doctrine would maintain that state legislatures cannot be bound by the substantive provisions in state constitutions or by voter-initiated enactments when states regulate national elections. If the court were to embrace that version, here are just a few of the provisions that state constitutions or voter initiatives have adopted that could not be applied in federal elections. Voters in Maine, Alaska, California, and Washington have enacted top two or top four primary structures or ranked choice voting for federal elections. Those rules could not be applied unless state legislatures chose to adopt them through legislation. Similarly, some state constitutions or these initiatives establish the criteria to be used in redistricting, such as whether districts must be compact, whether partisan considerations are banned or constrained, uh, what weight should be given to competitiveness in drawing districts, uh, and whether there should be independent commissions to do redistricting. In addition, some state constitutions contain provisions banning straight ticket voting or establishing voter identification requirements or creating all male voting systems or banning voters who fail to vote in the general election from voting in a runoff election or specifying how to fill vacant Senate seats by special election rather than gubernatorial appointment. A decision from the court endorsing this extreme version of the doctrine would be highly destabilizing since all these rules could no longer be applied to federal elections absent new legislation. A second, somewhat less extreme version of such a doctrine would be, state, would be that state courts can enforce state constitutional provisions that are very specific, such as the provision stating that Senate vacancies must be filled by a special election, but cannot enforce more general state constitutional provisions such as those that protect the right to vote or guarantee free and fair elections. 
This version would be less extreme, but it would trigger a whole host of ambiguous questions that would be difficult to resolve in a consistent and principled way. Just how specific does a state constitutional provision have to be for state courts to be able to enforce it against state legislatures in national elections? A third version of the doctrine would focus not on state constitutions, but the more routine acts of state election administration or judicial interpretation of state election laws. In this version, the US Constitution would be violate, violated if these actors strayed too far from the text of state election laws in applying them. The practical consequence of this version of such a doctrine would be that it could potentially turn many issues of election administration and interpretation into federal questions, which candidates and voters could try to exploit by running to the federal courts to second guess these judgments about the meeting of state election laws. Uh, now let me very briefly turn to the issue of what the historical basis is, if any, for the independent state legislature theory in these various versions. Uh, and I'll focus only on the state constitutional provision uh, question. First, scholars agree there is no evidence that the framers expressly understood the constitution to create such a doctrine. Indeed, what we have in the evidence is the opposite. At least five state constitutions in the founding era impose substantive constraints on such legislation. Um, second, before the Civil War, scholars have uncovered only one mention, not in any court decision, of such a doctrine. Third, until the 2000 Bush v. Gore decision, there doesn't appear to be any federal court precedent, including from the Supreme Court, which acknowledged any version of this doctrine. There is a scholarly debate over whether a few state Supreme Courts in the Civil War era and a congressional resolution of a contested election during that period did recognize such a doctrine. Uh, but even uh, if those uh, pieces of evidence support the doctrine, the overwhelming weight of historical practice illustrates that state constitutions throughout American history have imposed substantive constraints uh, on state legislation for national elections. Uh, and in sum, the practical consequences, should the court recognize the doctrine, are potentially quite destabilizing, especially depending on which version the court recognizes. Um, and there is minimal historical support for such a doctrine. Thank, Thank you. you very much, Professor. I'd now like to ask Professor Shapiro to give her testimony. Thank you. Chairperson Lofgren, Ranking Member Davis, and distinguished members of the committee. The independent state legislature theory, or the ISLT, can take a variety of forms, as everybody acknowledges. And during the 2020 election litigation, some Supreme Court justices appeared to embrace among the most extreme versions, such as second-guessing state courts' interpretations of their own laws. But almost every version of the ISLT starts with the claim that elections, the elections and electors clauses, which give state legislatures the authority to regulate federal elections, mean that when legislatures do so, what their own state constitutions require or prohibit does not matter. Nothing in the clauses compels that reading. An at least equally natural reading recognizes that legislatures are creatures of their constitutions and so may make laws only as allowed by them. Historical understanding and practice overwhelmingly support this latter view. A few highlights. From the time of the founding, state constitutions have regulated federal elections. Between 1789 and 1803, at least six state constitutions regulated whether elections should be by ballot or by voice vote, which was extremely controversial at the time, and those provisions were understood to apply to federal as well as state elections. Some early state constitutions explicitly regulated federal elections. The Delaware Constitution of 1792, for example, expressly regulated the election of congressional representatives. In addition, the overwhelming majority of state courts to consider state constitutional challenges to state laws regulating federal elections have applied their constitutions. Congress, too, has deferred to state constitutions when serving as the judge of its own elections. ISLT proponents point to a handful of state Supreme Court cases declining to apply state constitutional provisions to laws governing federal elections and to a single contested election in the House of Representatives in 1866. But those examples are, at most, outliers in a long swath of historical practice pointing in the other direction. And almost none of them unambiguously rely on the ISLT. 
There is also absolutely no historical evidence supporting the more extreme versions of the ISLT. For example, the notion that federal courts can second guess state courts' interpretations of their own laws seems to have first appeared in Chief Justice Rehnquist's concurring opinion in Bush versus Gore, where it is presented as a bald statement without citation. I turn now to the implications of the ISLT. To be blunt, it would be extraordinarily destabilizing. For example, most state election laws apply without distinction to federal and state elections. States generally have one voter registration system, for example. If a state court strikes down some aspect of those laws as violating the state constitution, the ISLT might require that the law nonetheless remain in effect for federal elections. Depending on the specific provisions, this would be at best confusing and unwieldy, at worst impossible. The same is true for statutory construction. The maximalist ISLT might require a different interpretation of the same statute to apply to federal elections than to state elections. The ISLT would thus disrupt and undermine state election administration. Despite rhetoric supporters use promising that the ISLT promotes predictability, it actually throws out centuries of state court precedent interpreting and applying state constitutions, including, for example, precedent establishing predictable approaches to the constitutional guarantees to free or equal elections that appear in more than half of state constitutions and have a history dating back to the founding era. The ISLT also rejects long-standing state jurisprudence on statutory interpretation and might require ignoring precedent construing identical statutory language. Likewise, despite rhetoric su re supporters use promising that the ISLT promotes political accountability by undermining expectations and longstanding practice, it actually makes it harder for voters to know what their legislatures have done. And by turning every question about state election law into a federal constitutional question, it shifts decision-making about the meaning of state election law away from state courts and elections administrators and to the federal courts, especially the Supreme Court. If nothing else, the ISLT will promote unending election litigation, bringing uncertainty and disruption. Congress has the power to avert many of the worst implications of the ISLT as well as to protect democracy in other ways, and I urge you to use that power. Thank you. Thank you very much. And finally, we'll hear from Ms. Swern uh, Beckers, uh, her testimony. Chair Lofgren, Ranking Member Davis, and members of the committee, thank you for the opportunity to testify about this dangerous and unprecedented legal claim being pressed by conservative activists. As you know, the Supreme Court agreed to hear Moore versus Harper, a case in which some North Carolina legislators have asked the court to embrace the so-called independent state legislature notion. This is the radical claim, theory is too generous a word, positing that the Constitution removes the normal checks on state legislatures when they regulate federal elections. You've already heard that the claim is wrong. The constitutional text, American history, Supreme Court precedent, sound policy, and common sense all refute the notion. I'll focus on the crushing consequences for American voters and our multiracial democracy if the Supreme Court turns this fringe notion into law. Here are four examples of what this idea could allow. First, the notion would green light partisan gerrymandering for congressional elections. A state legislature could draw an extreme partisan gerrymander without consequence, something that the state court would otherwise strike down as illegal under the state constitution. That is just as backwards as it sounds. State lawmakers could violate their own constitutions. Redistricting commissions in up to nine states would become defunct, and fair representation could become even more difficult, if impossible. That's because the Supreme Court already took federal constitutional protections off the table, ruling in the Rucho case that federal courts cannot stop partisan gerrymandering. The court pointed to state courts as the answer, but if state courts can't stop partisan gerrymanders, the tactic will thrive. Second, the radical claim will remove constraints on voter suppression. For example, a legislature could eliminate early voting, even if it's articulated in the state constitution and adopted by the people through direct democracy. The governor would be unable to stop this decision, 
and a state court would be powerless to stop it as well. Yes, voters could bring their case to federal court, but the Supreme Court has gutted the most powerful provisions of the Voting Rights Act and undercut other federal, federal voter protections. Third, the notion would create election chaos, disenfranchising voters and overwhelming election officials. The claim would undo hundreds of election laws in state constitutions enacted by ballot initiative and implemented through administrative rules. Policies enacted through direct democracy, like mail voting, same-day registration, and even voter ID could be wiped off the books for federal elections. Voters could be blocked from voting for candidates for federal office, even if they are eligible and they properly registered to vote. A range of other policies established in state constitutions rather than legislation would be voided. The right to cast a secret ballot, for example, is established in 44 state constitutions. Election officials would be forced to administer a two-tiered complex system with different policies for state and federal elections. It would be unclear which rules actually apply. And if election officials don't know what the law is, voters surely won't. Elect, excuse me. Fourth, the notion would remove critical checks against election interference and sabotage. The radical idea could enable legislatures to manipulate election outcomes. For example, they could enact arbitrary rules for counting votes. The claim would invite legal challenges asking federal courts to throw out ballots cast in reliance on constitutional provisions, laws enacted by ballot initiative, or policies implemented by election officials. To be clear, the independent state legislature claim is not a license to coup. Federal law prohibits state legislatures from overturning the results of elections. But the notion would open the door to anti-democratic shenanigans and even failed efforts to manipulate our elections, erode trust, and ultimately participation in our democracy. Even if the court embraces this radical notion, Congress can thwart many of its worst consequences. The Elections Clause, the very same constitutional provision that activists are trying to weaponize against democracy, gives Congress the power to enhance and protect voting rights and ensure fair representation. Regardless of how the court rules, I urge you to revisit and pass the Freedom to Vote John R. Lewis Act. The bill would set national standards for voting access, prohibit partisan gerrymandering, add federal protections against election sabotage, and add federal protections against election interference and sabotage. This legislation is critically needed. Thank you. Thank you very much, and thanks to each one of our witnesses for their testimony. We are now in a, a time in the hearing when members may ask questions of our witnesses for as much as five minutes, and I would turn first to the gentleman from Georgia for his questions. Thank you, Madam Chair. It's a pleasure to be with all of you here today, and thank you to all of our witnesses for being here. I was very intrigued with the, uh, the testimonies there, um, especially with the, uh, the extreme ISL uh, theories that people are putting out there. But first, let me say, I'm proud to join with uh, Ranking Member Davis and my good friend, Mr. Style, and several others on a bill that, that we're pushing forward, the American Confidence in Elections Act, that actually takes meaningful steps to secure our election, while still respecting the Federalist principles that our framers put into the Constitution. And as we discuss the, this ISL theory today, I think we should keep in mind that the versions that we've heard today include a very extreme uh, version of this theory. Um, and I don't want us to jump to conclusions that the Supreme Court would embrace an extreme version of this. I've heard, look, our, just as the U.S. Constitution is a restriction on the power of the federal government, including a restriction on the legislature, state constitutions are restrictions on the state power, including their legislatures, and those constitutions exist for a purpose. And I agree wholly that a legislature cannot override their constitution without some amendment to that constitution. A lot of what I heard here explained today, ironically, sounds a lot about the arguments that our side made against the, federal, the, the attempts for a federal takeover of state elections by H.R. 1 from uh, my colleagues on the other side of the aisle. So um, I, I agree with much of what you're saying, but we need to be clear that I think the more extreme version, we should not just assume the Supreme Court is going to agree with that. Um, I do have a few questions, though. Um, Ms. Uh, Becker, 
When the framers penned the elections clause in Article I, Section 4, what did they understand the term legislature to mean? Now, uh, I know from reading Federalist Papers and writings of our framers and our founders, they chose their words very carefully for specific meaning. So um, what do you understand that they, they, that they, the term legislature meant to them when they framed the Constitution? Thank you for that question. I've, I've had the pleasure of looking through this historical record, looking at the debate during the Constitutional Convention on the Elections Clause and the ratification debates in every state when they were discussing the Elections Clause. What is clear is that the framers were trying to constrain the power of state legislatures. They wanted to make sure that these state lawmakers, who they deeply distrusted, would not have exclusive power to regulate federal elections. And that's why the second part of the Elections Clause gives Congress the power to make or alter federal election law. It is therefore absurd and, and sort of directly contrary to the historical record to think that those very same framers would have given to the legislature alone in a state the power to regulate federal elections without but the normal checks and balances. If I could get you to narrow, narrow down to answer the question, what does the term legislature mean? And, and, and we have a different interpretation from studying the, the founding era. What I read is during the debates, they mostly distrusted the government they were creating. Most of them came from state legislatures. So they were more concerned with the power of the federal government overriding state legislatures. And look, I'm not defending the ISL theory here. My question is, what do they mean by, in, in Article I, Section 4, the term legislature? I appreciate your question. I yeah. think we have a, a different reading of the historical record, but nevertheless, the one thing that I think is instructive in understanding what the framers meant when they used the word legislature is what the framers meant when they used the word Congress in the other part of the Elections Clause. Nobody understands that Elections Clause to give Congress the power to enact laws that don't need to be sent to the, to the President for his signature or veto. Nobody understands that part of the Elections Clause to give Congress the power to enact laws that federal courts can't adjudicate. The same is true for legislature in the first the point, part of the Elections Clause. Quickly running out of time here. Mike, I still don't know that we got the answer about what legislature means. So. Um, one of the things that the framers did is they wanted to make sure that future generations understood the meaning that they put in the, the document itself um, for future generations, because we have an evolution of language. So actually, Newell Webster worked with many from them to create the first dictionary of American English language, the Webster's 1828 Dictionary, which in the foreword, he said, was to help future generations of Americans interpret. The term legislature in that document is as he's saying our, frame, our founders intended it to mean is the body of persons in a state or a kingdom invested with the power to make and repeal laws. He then goes on and explains what the state legislatures mean, which is those elected bodies within the state with the power to pass and repeal laws as constrained by the Constitution. So I'm, I'm sorry I wasn't able to get to any other questions, but I think we need to make sure that if we're interpreting legislature one way, it needs to be consistently interpreted throughout the entire document of the Constitution, not being able to use uh, uh, one interpretation for one uh, article and clause and not another. With that, Madam Chair, I yield back. Gentlemen's time has expired. Mr. Raskin is recognized. Thank you, uh, Madam Chair, for calling this very important hearing. Um, and uh, Professor Becker, is it, am I calling you the right name? Or? Swearing Becker, but I am not a professor, so I can't claim that title. Ms. Swearing Becker, forgive me, I don't have my glasses on, so I just, um, but, um, okay, well, I want to go right to that point you were making before. If you go to the elections clause, um, it's set up, it seems purposefully to create Congress as a backstop for the state legislatures to make sure that Congress could regulate um, time, place, manner, elections, and so on, but over the states if necessary. Um, did that give Congress the power or the right to do that um, outside of uh, a presidential signature on bills we're passing, outside of judicial review? In other words, is there an independent Congress doctrine too? Thank you for the question, Representative. And of course, there is no independent Congress doctrine. 
the framers use the word Congress and the framers use the, use the word legislature in context, in the context of the checks and balances that apply both to state legislatures and to Congress. So in other words, if we are to exercise our power under the elections clause to um, you know, legislate, just say the Voting Rights Act, for example, I know that was section five of the 14th Amendment, but I think elections clause was implicated too. Um, when it was passed by Congress, it still needed to be signed by the president, right? Even though it said Congress had the power to do it. Um, and so similarly, state legislatures passing election laws have always sent those, have always sent their bills to their governor under their state constitutions for signatures. Isn't that right? Yes. So um, the independent state legislature doctrine would suddenly announce that more than two centuries of state election laws are somehow unconstitutional, um, or at least went through an unnecessary step of being signed by the governor and operating under state constitutional veto requirements and so on. Is that right? Yes, this theory, if it were embraced, would nullify hundreds of election laws that have been in place for many, many years, in some cases, centuries. The, as, as my colleagues have reflected, state constitutions were adopted around the time of the ratification of the Constitution that themselves constrained state legislatures. Everyone understood at the time that state legislatures are creatures of their own constitution and are constrained by them, including requirements for gubernatorial veto and judicial review. Okay, but there are some places in the Constitution where the legislature does operate independently, right? As opposed to in this normal legislative capacity. Are there not? Yes, there are certain instances. But what are some examples of that? Maybe I could come to you, Professor Shapira. Yes, the legislature acts separately, independently when it is, for example, being asked to ratify a federal constitutional amendment or during the times when, in, during the time when senators were directly chosen, appointed by state legislatures, they acted Before the 17th Amendment. Before the 17th Amendment, yeah. uh, they acted independently. And the Constitution uses different verbs to describe what the legislatures do in those contexts, as opposed to saying direct, for example, uh, as the electors clause uses, they use words like appoint, uh, which is what the, the Constitution referred to before the 17th Amendment with respect to se uh, appointment of senators. And so the word legislature has to be understood in the context of precisely what it is that the legislature is being asked to do or being authorized to do by the Constitution. Okay, so um, let's see. Uh, Professor Pildes, if you're still out there, um, but I'd like to ask you about that very point. Um, the, the claim seems to uh, be made now that if the state legislatures can act independently for any specific constitutional purpose, they must be able to act independently for all constitutional purposes, including the primary purpose of ordinary lawmaking. Is that right? Professor? You need to unmute Rick, I think. I thought I had. Is that unmuted? Yes, okay. we can hear you now. Sorry about that. Um, I think your statement is correct because if we take Congress, when Congress proposes constitutional amendments, Congress does not have to present those to the president. And in fact, the Bill of Rights was not presented to the president before it was adopted or sent out to the states to be ratified. So that's an example of the federal context where we wouldn't, of course, conclude that Congress, when it exercises powers to regulate federal elections, doesn't have to present the bill to the president. So I think that's a very good example from the federal context. And I think Justice Ginsburg's opinion in the Arizona Independent Redistricting case does acknowledge that before the 17th Amendment, state legislatures might have been independent in their role as elector, but not in their role of regulating in ordinary lawmaking. Gentlemen's time has expired. I turn to Mr. Stile for his questions. Thank you very much, uh, Madam Chairwoman. Appreciate you holding today's hearing. I want to start uh, just by jumping back to yesterday for a second uh, on the importance of making sure that our elections um, are free, fair, and secure. Uh, in note that I'm proud to join uh, the ranking member, Mr. Davis, uh, my colleague, uh, Mr. Loudermilk to my right, um, in introducing the, Aid Act, the ACE Act, uh, 
uh, to inspire voter confidence uh, and election integrity. I think it's a really important piece of legislation uh, that was introduced yesterday uh, and one that I would encourage folks uh, to look into. I'd like to direct my questions on today's topic uh, to Mr. Pildes if I can. Uh, we've heard um, testimony today from witnesses stating that the independent state legislature theory uh, is one that could impact uh, our elections process. And so I'd like to start by asking you uh, if, if there's any specific legal precedents affirming uh, legislators do not have uh, the absolute power uh, in elections. What have the courts held on this issue? Well, the courts have certainly always applied state constitutions to assess state election laws. Uh, the courts have never second guessed the interpretation or administration of state election laws through the federal constitution. Uh, we didn't get any indication of that until the three justice concurrence written by Chief Justice Rehnquist in Bush v. Gore. Uh, and no federal court has ever adopted the doctrine, at least up to this point just a, a few opinions, statements, and that concurring opinion. So, so, you, so you, you, you know they've, they've, never, they've, they've never held it. Have they ever held against uh, independent uh, state legislative theory? Um, I don't think the issue, uh, as far as I know, was ever presented to federal courts before it was raised in 2000. Uh, okay. So the practice has been, you know, to, to not apply no, such a doctrine. Un, 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 but understood, but, but, never, but, ne but never ruled on. That's fine. Just helpful for us to, to understand the topic. Never been ruled on. Uh, I want to walk through a couple implications here. Um, how would um, independent state legislative theory uh, impact states that have independent uh, redistricting commissions? We heard um, uh, a, a previous witness reference um, the impact that it may have. Well, the Supreme Court has already upheld the power of voters through voter initiatives to create independent commissions for congressional districting. Uh, that was a five to four decision. There has been discussion about uh, how solid the precedent will remain, but that is certainly the precedent today. Okay, shift gears slightly. How would ISLT uh, theory impact a state's election certification process? Well, it depends, of course, on exactly which version of the theory we're talking about. Uh, but since certification is primarily administration, interpretation, um, it would only be impacted if the Supreme Court were to conclude that there's a federal role in second-guessing the application and interpretation of state law. Okay. Uh, third question. Um, how would it impact state constitutional amendment uh, that would be approved uh, by the voters through a ballot measure? Well, the first answer is that if state constitutional provisions are off the table altogether, then those would fall uh, along with the general state constitution. Uh, maybe uh, uh, there's an attraction among some to a doctrine that the state constitution is fine, but not voter-initiated amendments. Uh, but I, I'm not sure exactly how one would, one would defend that distinction. I, I appreciate your insights today. I appreciate you holding the hearing. Madam Chairwoman, I will yield back. Gentleman yields back. Mr. Butterfield is recognized. Thank you very much, Madam Chair, for convening this very important hearing, and thank you to the witnesses for your testimony. You know, I uh, represent one of 13 districts in North Carolina, and as all of you certainly know, the Rucho case originated in my state, as well as the Moore versus Harper case, and so I'm a little bit more acquainted with these cases than I would say most members of, of, of Congress. Uh, and so I'm real concerned about this. Uh, some years ago, we challenged the congressional map uh, on the basis of partisan gerrymandering. We took the case in the federal court and the lower federal courts ruled in our favor and ruled that the state legislature uh, engaged in partisan gerrymandering and that it was a violation of the federal constitution. And that case was taken to the U.S. Supreme Court and unfortunately uh, the high court decided that, uh, that political gerrymandering is, is not, uh, it's not protected by, by the federal constitution. But in that opinion, in that Rucho opinion, uh, the court suggested that it may be cognizable under the state constitution, but not under the federal constitution. And so as the years went on, uh, that's when the, the Moore versus Harper case came along. And so we decided to uh, do what the Supreme Court has suggested. Uh, we litigated the, uh, the redistricting map uh, in state court. And again, we prevailed in state court. In fact, the state Supreme Court uh, ruled that the, that the congressional map was an extreme intentional partisan gerrymander and directed the legislature to fix it. And the legislature uh, had to, had to uh, follow the, 
directive of the court. And so now um, we have a new map. Uh, the map is a fairer map than it was originally. Uh, but unfortunately, the plaintiffs in the case have now, or at least the defendants in the case, uh, have now taken the matter to the U.S. Supreme Court, and now the Supreme Court is going to uh, have to decide whether or not state courts have any authority whatsoever over, over e election laws within the state. And so I guess my question is, um, Professor, uh, I guess you're still with us online, are we overreacting? Are we overreacting, or is it likely that the Supreme Court will, will decide that state legislatures can enact election laws affecting federal elections and deny state courts the authority to make a constitutional ruling? Are we overreacting, or is this real? Uh, Representative Butterfield, let me start by saying I have been writing about North Carolina redistricting since the early 1990s. Um, and I was actually part of the, the legal team representing Common Cause in the Rucho case that you described. Uh, I was involved uh, in the I, Jingles I, case. Uh, you may recall yeah. Jingles. Yeah, I was very much involved uh, absolutely. in that case. Yeah. Uh, absolutely. I think as all these questions have indicated, um, it's very difficult to say because there are a whole variety of versions of this doctrine that have been hinted at, uh, and some would have extremely destabilizing consequences to be sure. Uh, and most of them would have significantly destabilizing uh, consequences. Uh, and there are lots of legal uncertainties that would be unleashed uh, under any version of this doctrine. Uh, so, you know, yes, I do think it's, it's a concern about what the doctrine might be if such a doctrine is endorsed by the court uh, and exactly, you know, how destabilizing it would be, uh, how much litigation it would unleash. Uh, there's no question that disappointed candidates and voters uh, will run to federal court uh, to try to overturn state court uh, interpretations. Uh, and, and so, you know, there's a lot of uncertainty here, but, you, but there's you, no you, question you really believe, destabilizing. So you're prospect. saying that you really believe that the U.S. Supreme Court will decide that, that uh, state courts do not have the authority to interpret and enforce the state constitution? You really believe the U.S. Supreme Court will go that far? Well, I'm not, I'm not going to make any predictions here, but I can tell you that uh, Justices Alito and Justice Thomas, at the least, have signaled uh, that they are very disturbed by, this is in the context of Pennsylvania, state court constitutional rulings about state election law. So there's no question that that's a serious issue before the court, uh, and there are some indications that at least some justices are prepared to accept such a view. Thank you, Madam Chair. You're back. Gentleman yields back. Mr. Aguilar is recognized. Thank you, Chairwoman. Ms. Swernbecker, leading up to January 6th, the former president and his loyalists invoked ISL theory, and I know that there's different doctrines, you know, out there as we've as we've heard. Um, but that was cited as part of the creation of quote fake electors. Uh, that would be submitted to Congress to get the then Vice President to send the results of the Electoral College back to the states to prevent certification. Can you tell us how this theory uh, informed uh, the strategy that ended up being used uh, by these individuals, John Eastman, Rudy Giuliani, and others, to undermine legally cast uh, ballots of millions of Americans? Thank you for the question. To be clear, the independent state legislature notion, if adopted, would not let state legislatures send a fake slate of electors uh, to Congress to be certified. Uh, as I said, the theory is not a license to coup. But you're correct that President Trump relied on the theory in challenging policies that were in place in states across the country, trying to get ballots thrown out that were cast in reliance on policies adopted by secretaries of state or governors, for example. And so this notion was the legal backbone that informed this effort to overturn the will of voters. If the Supreme Court gives credence to extreme versions of this theory, is there scenarios where you know, alternate slates um, are submitted um, and the president who fails to win 270 electoral votes uh, could be certified as president? As I said, the theory wouldn't permit that kind of scenario, but it does open the door to efforts by state legislatures to attempt those kinds of anti-democratic shenanigans. Federal law would prohibit that from happening, 
but legislatures might try to change the rules for vote counting, for example, or might try to institute sham audits to affect the results of elections. So there are other ways that legislatures might try to interfere with elections even beyond that, those fake electors and that strategy. Thank you. Professor Shapiro, uh, we've, we talk often in this, in this committee room about uh, our local uh, officials, election administrators, um, uh, many of them who are, you know, struggling um, with resource issues, and um, uh, some of them have received threats over the past few election cycles as well. You know, can you describe what could happen um, uh, to communities of color if basic and essential voting rights regulations, which state elections officials administer, are gutted in response to some of these uh, theories. Uh, in, your, in your written testimony, you claim that uh, some of those local elections officials might struggle uh, based on the interpretation uh, of these theories. Every decision that a local of election official makes that involves discretion could be second-guessed and litigated in federal court. Uh, w even where those particular decisions have been affirmed or ratified by state courts, in Pennsylvania, for example, in 2020, there was litigation about whether or not state uh, uh, county clerks could have drop boxes at, in which voters could, could put their mail-in ballots, and the, the Pennsylvania Supreme Court concluded that the statute should be interpreted to allow those drop boxes at the discretion of the local officials. Under the ISLT, or at least some of the uh, extreme theories, extreme versions of it, the federal courts would be able to come in and revisit that essentially de novo and say that, that they don't, that's not how they read the statute, even though under normal circumstances, state courts have the final say over what, what uh, state, uh, state statutes mean, and discretion is delegated to election officials so that they can actually do their job. What could this mean to communities of color? Well, I think to the extent that communities of color are already in under-resourced areas in, or in uh, areas with high population density, there may be uh, more need in those contexts for election officials to try to find ways to ensure that everybody has the right to vote. That means that they may need to exercise discretion in ways that perhaps in a small rural county that is prim uh, predominantly white, they're, they're just the same issues simply don't arise. And so the, the need to exercise discretion in these particular ways might not be there. It also, I think, opens the door for this kind of litigation that is essentially uh, going to be incredibly time consuming, incredibly resource intensive. Uh, Any time somebody doesn't agree with a, a particular discretionary decision or even sees it as strategically beneficial to challenge the particular Thank decision, which will deter officials from making those kinds of decisions. Thank you so much. Yield yeah. back, Madam Chair. Gentlemen's time has expired. I have um, just a couple of questions. You know, uh, Article um, uh, 1 says that the time, places, and manners will be prescribed in each state. And every state has decided to have an election votes by their citizens. Uh, that's, that's every single, all 50 states have decided the American citizens are going to decide this by a vote. Some have suggested that if, if you took um, the extreme independent uh, legislature theory uh, to the maximum amount, that it could empower state legislatures to essentially decide otherwise. You have a vote, you don't like the result, the legislature appoints who they want. Um, so, uh, P Professor Pildes, I mean, I'd like you to comment on that assertion, and some state legislators ha did indeed suggest that uh, in the, during the last presidential election, and your comment whether reform of the Electoral Count Act could play a role in remedying such a threat to the right of Americans to select their government. Thank you very much for that question. Uh, so first, um, even as things stand today, uh, Congress decides the date on which electors have to be appointed. That's a constitutional power Congress has. Mm -hmm. 
And it means that state legislatures cannot, after election day, suddenly decide, we don't like the popular vote, we're going to appoint the electors. That's unconstitutional. The Electoral Count Act reform, at least the bipartisan bill that's been publicly introduced, uh, would help solidify that structure by making it clear uh, in ways that I think is already in the original act, but it would make this would make it much more clear that states have to act pursuant to laws and procedures established in advance of the election. And that's what we all want. We want clear rules established in advance of the election that can't be manipulated after the fact for one partisan purpose or another. So I do think the, the bill that's been introduced uh, would help secure the process well, against those we, kinds we of We have things. been working on a bill as well that is not quite done but should be introduced uh, in the next couple of weeks and uh, we'll be discussing with our Senate uh, counterparts how to, how to reach consensus. I, I'm sure that there, we will come to a meeting of the minds in a very cordial way. Here's a question for anyone. You know, I've often thought, you know, when some of the rhetoric that, you know, was pursued that the state legislators could simply send in their own uh, electoral uh, slate, despite what the vote had been in their, in their state, what the role of uh, Article 4, Section 4 uh, has in, in such a decision. The United States guarantees to every state in this union a Republican form of government. And that, it would seem to me, does not include um, a state legislature throwing out the votes of its voters and imposing its own decision instead. Does anybody have a comment on that? The, I, I would say agree with, first of all, I agree with my colleagues that the state legislatures under the Constitution can't, after the fact, change the rules about how the electors are chosen. Whether they can, be, the state, independent state legislature theory, however, might allow them to put rules in place before the election that say, for example, take away from the courts the ability to adjudicate disputes about, about the election after the fact and put, give the power to determine con election contests to legislature itself. Now, you're asking if that might violate the Guarantee Clause. Uh, the Guarantee Clause, of course, has been held to be non-justiciable, but surely it provides Congress with the opportunity to regulate how, how these types of decisions are made. And I think it would be well within congressional power to say that, that the Guarantee Clause requires. Well, the question isn't whether it's justiciable, but when the court looks at this in the whole context of the Constitution to elevate state legislators without looking at a, a framework that is a Republican form of government would be inconsistent with that amendment, wouldn't it? With that section of the Constitution? I think it would be inconsistent, but the court has not shown itself to be very interested in looking to the Guarantee Clause when it interprets other relevant clauses of the Constitution. I'll just reiterate, though, you have the power to rely on the Guarantee Clause. I understand. My time has expired, and I'm going to turn the gavel over to Mr. Raskin to uh, recognize our, our new member. Thank you, Madam Chair. Uh, I recognize uh, the gentlelady from Pennsylvania, Ms. Gantlin. Thank you, Mr. Raskin. Um, you know, I've gotten a lot of questions from constituents um, over the last few weeks in the wake of the grant of certiorari for, or review for the um, case raising this ISL theory. Um, so I'm trying to explain to constituents even as I look into it further. And we do that in Pennsylvania through the lens of what has been going on in Pennsylvania for the last few years. We've had... Uh, statutory gerrymandering, we've had strict voter ID laws, those have both been pushed back through um, litigation, and then of course during the 2020 election we found our results under attack, um, without basis, but nevertheless under attack through a variety of um, court cases, dozens of them in fact. Um, can you, sp I think you raised that in, in your testimony, um, Ms. Shapiro, can you talk about um, the impact of that theory and, and what we need to be concerned about? Well, you need to be concerned about, among other things, all of these decisions that the state 
courts have made uh, and all of the precedent that exists that, they, that the state courts rely on and indeed that the legislature relies on, uh, going f whether or not those will continue to be effective with respect to federal elections. Uh, you also need to be concerned about whether the rules might be different for federal elections versus state elections, regardless of whether or not the legislature actually passes different laws, because they might be interpreted differently or because to the extent that the state court strikes down aspects of the laws uh, with respect to the, the federal courts might say they still must be in effect with respect to federal elections. So there could be an enormous amount of chaos, to put it mildly. Well, and that has been one of the problems we've had to address is that there has been chaos with changing rules and um, impacting the electorate and people not being certain of what's going forward. And of course, that damages our institutions in general. Um, do you have recommendations on what we should do as Congress to protect the right to vote in light of the kinds of things we've seen happening in Pennsylvania? Well, I certainly would, with respect to the ISLT, Congress could, for example, pass a law that says that with respect to state laws governing federal elections, the, it should, it, the presumption is, or the actual rule is, that they necessarily incorporate state constitutional provisions and all manner of ordinary judicial review, statutory interpretation, et cetera. Um, you could pass a law that limits the timing under which federal courts, including the Supreme Court, can intervene. Uh, especially after a f state court has already ruled on a particular issue. You could also address other issues. You could, as you just consider doing in HR 1, address extreme partisan gerrymandering. And you could do that even with respect to state legislative offices, in my view, under the Guarantee Clause. Mm -hmm. I mean, it has been interesting. We hear a lot of sort of specious arguments about the Elections Clause, Article 1, Section 4, and whether or not um, Congress has the power to address um, what's happening in our elections in the states. Can you just summarize that you, quickly? There's no question that the Congress has the power to address congressional elections under Article 1, Section 4. It expressly gives Congress the power to do so. The Congress also has the power under the Guarantee Clause to guarantee a Republican form of government and, in fact, has the obligation to do so. There's nothing in the Constitution to suggest that the federal government can't ensure that states operate the federal elections properly, but it is, the, it is Congress that has that power, not the federal courts taking it away from state courts. Thank you, and I would defer to our constitutional expert, but I, I believe my recollection is that it was some kind of um, misconduct in South Carolina that led um, the framers of the Constitution to insert that clause and yeah, make the election sure. clause. Yeah. I, I, I'll take your word for it. I can't remember what okay. state it was in, but uh, but I know the power is there and the purpose is clear. Um, I'm, I'm going to ask a few more questions. Yes, and we'll, I yield we'll open back. Open up to Mr. Stiles and anybody else. So, General Lady yields back. Um, let's see. But under the extreme versions of this independent state legislature hypothesis, um, and I've not read the literature about it, and I'd be interested to know whether there is a law review corpus around this, but. Are they asserting that um, a legislature could actually enact legislative changes, say, repealing vote by mail or adopting vote by mail or uh, moving to um, you know, instant runoff voting or overthrowing instant runoff voting without uh, sending the legislation to the governor of the state under the Constitution? Uh, Ms. Swearenbecker? Thank you for the question. And I'll first note that there are um, there is a wealth of scholarship rebutting this independent state legislature theory. So there is lots of evidence. But is there anything on the other side? I mean, are, are you guys just debating a mirage here? Or is it just <laughs> an idea that popped up in the Supreme Court, but there's no support for it either historically or academically? There is no serious evidence on the other side. There is no support historically. There is no There is no support legally. The Supreme Court has repeatedly rejected this idea in precedent after precedent. As after recently precedent. as the Arizona case, right? Yes, as recently as 2015, the court rejected this theory outright. Okay, but but is someone claiming somewhere that a legislature could actually adopt election laws without sending it to the governor of the state under the state constitution? 
That is the logical extension of this theory. Wow. The notion that, oh, excuse me, sorry. Yeah, no, that was just a wow. You continue, so. <laughs> the, the notion that a, it is the legislature alone outside of the ordinary lawmaking process and without the ordinary checks and balances that apply to the state lawmaking body, that is the premise of this independent state legislature notion. And it's just as radical and shocking as you suggest. Okay, Professor Shapiro, you mentioned something in passing that really caught my attention. You said that under the doctrine a state legislature could divest the courts of the ability to review the, um, the election laws they're adopting? I mean, are you saying that, that the, the, the turbocharged version of the independent state legislature um, theory would actually allow them to say, we're carving out an exception to Marbury versus Madison and there wouldn't even be federal constitutional review? No, I, I don't think that the, the state legislature can prevent federal constitutional review, but it certainly could, under the theory, under the turbocharged version, prevent state court. But it sounds like it doesn't review. even have to. That, that, that's the force of the independent state legislature yes. doctrine. In fact, it couldn't do it even if it wanted to, right? In other words, if the legislature said, and we will leave this up to an administrative agency to interpret the particular times or placement of voting precincts or what have you, they couldn't do that. Under some versions of the theory, and Justice Gorsuch suggested that he might be open to that version in, in his opinion in one of the North Carolina cases in 2020. The legislature of the state under um, this more expansive notion must act as a legislature and as an administrative agency and as its own court interpreting the state constitution, although the state constitution may be completely irrelevant here. It's as if they're saying the state legislature acts in a completely different capacity and exists as a different kind of beast when it governs election law. And state election law, or state constitutional law is just irrelevant. Am I overreading that, Ms. Mm -hmm. Becker? No, that's exactly right. The the logical extension of this theory is there is no separation of powers. The judiciary doesn't get to say what the law is. The Constitution has no bearing on what the legislature can do, nor does the governor, but only in the, the instance of regulating federal elections. Yeah. And that exception makes absolutely no sense. I, I, I just want to say that, you know, it seems to me, given that there's no uh, historical basis for this, given that there's no real academic support for it, it, it seems like there's an effort to spot places that benefit uh, a particular political destination or program and then say, we're in control there, let's dramatically inflate the power of that office or person. It's sort of like what happened on January 6th, where it was said, well, the vice president actually has the power to count electoral college votes and unilaterally, without Congress being involved, reject electoral college votes and essentially determine who's going to be president. Um, and there was never any basis for that. Nobody ever claimed it. it. It's surprising nobody would have noticed it for more than two centuries of American constitutional and, and uh, senatorial and congressional practice. Uh, and yet, that was a claim being made. It was a coup in search of legal theory, as Judge Carter said, from California. And I, I'm afraid that this is a little bit of a, a political fix in search of a legal, legal theory, too. I'm happy to recognize my friend, Mr. Stiles. Thank you very much. Um, Let's just dive back in uh, here. We're on round two. Um, Mr. Ms. Sorry, not a professor. You said that earlier too, right? Ms. Ms. Warren Becker, um, you gave uh, testimony regarding independent state legislative theory, claiming that the theory uh, is is adopted by the, if adopted by the courts, uh, it would deprive voters of free and fair elections. And you pivoted to January six uh, and the facts uh, and the and the fact that states have enacted uh, various election reform measures. Um, would, can you confirm, would your position on ISL uh, be the same for democratically controlled states, uh, often with veto-proof legislatures uh, like Illinois or Maryland? Thank you for the question. What I think you're pointing <clears throat> out here is that the independent state legislature theory is bad for Americans, no matter what side of the aisle you're on. It would remove- Is, is, that, and is that your position? Absolutely. Okay. Um, shift, shift slightly, you also mentioned that if ISL was adopted as a legal doctrine and state legislatures uh, would not have a check and balance on their power. Is that a fair analysis of your statement? 
Yes, this notion removes checks and balances <clears throat> that apply to state legislatures. Do, do you think that voters play a powerful check on state legislators uh, since they're the ones that elect them? Yes, absolutely, and that's why it's so concerning that this notion could remove the power of voters to enact laws through direct democracy. I appreciate your comments, Mr. Chair. Mr. Or, Faust, Chair, I'll yield back. Th thank you very much. Um, and I don't know, uh, Ms. Scanlon, did you have any further questions? Um, all right, well, in that event, um, we're, we're gonna come to a close here. Um, I, I think that all of our expert witnesses have demonstrated that there's no foundation in the text of the Constitution, in the structure of uh, our constitutional system, in the history uh, or the practice of elections for this uh, radical and brazen claim. And um, I, I'm glad we seem to have some kind of uh, uh, bipartisan agreement about the strangeness of uh, this doctrine. I want to thank all the witnesses for their valuable testimony, um, and I want to thank the members for their excellent questioning today. The members might have additional questions going forward for the witnesses, and if so, we will ask you to uh, respond in writing if you would. The hearing record will be held open uh, for those responses, and without objection, uh, the Committee on House Administration now stands adjourned.